Welcome to Examining the Scriptures. We're so glad you've joined us for this brief look at the Word of God together. Today, we're looking at one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible, and it's a passage that calls us to really live radically obedient lives, and it's a bit of a shocking verse. So we're in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, as you can see on your screen. And the first word I want us to notice is the word, therefore. I, therefore. Now, anytime you see a therefore in the Bible, and we saw this last week as well, you're asking context, and this therefore is going to point us back and forth. Therefore, and so far in Ephesians, there's been 66 verses, if you can imagine, Ephesians 1 to 3. And in those verses, there has only been one command until now. So it's basically saying, therefore, based on how awesome God is, based based on the sovereignty of God, his election, his calling us before the creation of the world, based on the immensity and beauty of the gospel and the unity that brings and the love of Jesus, I have something to tell you. If we're studying this verse, these therefore should cause us to stop, to see la, and to, to take that brief look back and say, what is he basing his argument upon? This, this argument now, this command, what is he basing this command upon? And then moving forward, we notice that he not only wants us to see, before we get into the actual command, he wants us to see something a little bit about who he is, a prisoner for the Lord. Now, sometimes there's debate in terms of, is this literal prisoner or figurative? Is he saying he's a prisoner in terms of being in jail? Or is he a prisoner meaning he is someone who is fully devoted to God and will do whatever God requires, demands? And I think the answer is fairly simple. It means both. He is a fully devoted follower of Jesus. He's someone who understands chapters 1 to 3 and is going to live his life based on that. Someone we should listen to. Someone They should listen to. He's a prisoner of the Lord, the master, the one who is sovereign over him. Now, he's got this word, I urge you. He's saying, now I want you, based on these things, based on all of the doctrine to this point, all that we've studied, I want you to listen carefully based on who I am as a prisoner for the Lord, the the one who should teach you these things. I want you to walk. Now, before we move on from this word here, let's, let's just understand this word, especially in the Old Testament but also in the new, it's basically saying this is how you live. Whenever you see the word walk in the Bible, just think in your everyday life, all of the time, this this is what I want for you, or in this case, what I want from you in your everyday life. Now, this is where it is very, very shocking. He spent three chapters, 66 verses, outlining the greatness of the gospel, the greatness of God, the awesomeness of our salvation, his calling on our lives. And Now he says, I want you to live in a manner worthy of the calling. Now we've seen this word a number of times in this text. This is the sovereign calling of God on our lives to follow him to be Christians. I want you to walk in a manner worthy. This is the idea of a balance scale. So on the one side, you have the calling, the gospel, the greatness of God. On the other side, you have your life, and he's saying, I want you to balance the scales. I want you to walk in a way that your life displays the beauty and awesomeness of what God has done for you and of who God is. I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, this should be breathtaking. I suppose it's impossible when we understand the incredible grace of God. And I think we could all say together with a deep sigh of relief that God's grace is for us before we're saved, while we're being saved, and after we're saved. So certainly we're accepted by grace, not this manner worthy of the calling but it's what we're to be. It's who we're to be. Now, if I was writing this and I had just written this, you, you've been saved. That's amazing. You, your debt has been canceled. You've been forgiven. You've been freed. The gospel is true. You've moved from an object of wrath to a trophy of grace. In light of this, I think I probably would be with Peter and say, live a holy life as God is holy or be pure or those sort of things. It's interesting, the very first place that this goes in verse two. So remember now, six, six verses, only one command. Now he's saying, Listen to me in light of that doctrine. Listen to me in light of me being a prisoner of the Lord. Walk worthy. What does that worthy walk look like to Paul as a priority? And the answer is very interesting. The answer is he's going to go after unity in the church, unity in the local church, the bride of Christ. I'm not entirely sure why he goes after this, but I wonder sometimes if it's not because God hates division because God is one. In fact, if you keep going, you'll discover what they call the sevenfold unity in verse four of this text, and it goes on to the oneness of God and the gospel and the call and all of those things, the doctrinal unity. But 
we won't take the time to get there. Instead, I just want us to notice that walking worthy of the gospel, or being a mature Christian, or maturing as a Christian, is to have a passionate pursuit of unity. Now, you might say, well, okay, how do I do that? Can we get a little bit more practical in that pursuit of unity? And the answer is, well, the unity of the Spirit, we don't want to forget that. The bond of peace, we don't want to forget that either. And in fact, next week, we'll talk a little bit more about what this peace means and looks like practically. But but how do we do that? And he throws out some words. Now, if you're studying this, you will just kind of move probably rapidly through this, and we'll move rapidly through this as well. But notice the first word, all humility. That's a fascinating word because humility means, as C.S. Lewis has so profoundly put, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking less of yourself. In other words, it's not putting yourself down. It's, it's not seeing yourself as the center. Now, the unfortunate thing we have in the modern culture is so often we see ourselves at the center. This humility means that all of a sudden, God and our calling are at the center. We're walking worthy of this calling. We're pursuing then love and unity and this bond of peace. And humility becomes a central part. It's not about me, not about my feelings, not about me being hurt, but about me loving God and loving you with all gentleness. This is a word that is an overflow of care. Power under control. I'm, I'm able to do something harsh, and instead I choose gentleness, care, tenderness, patience. And this word patience is going to be defined in just a minute, but if you've been in the church very long, you know that you need this because there's some pretty strange people in the church, and if each of us was to look in the mirror, we could probably start with the stranger in the mirror. And This patience is something that says, I'm going to bear with the people around me in love. And here is that perfect word that Christ modeled and then calls us to in 1 Corinthians 13, this kind of love that we stand firm on. And notice it's in every effort. It's a passionate pursuit. It's a deep desire. Think think of yourself as an Olympic athlete. You look to God and you say, wow, you saved me. That's the foundation. You you saved me and you're one and you've called me to live as one and you've given me the pattern for that. And my job is to be someone who walks, who lives everyday life all of the time in a manner worthy of this calling I've received He's the one who called it worthy of God. Here's how to do it. Really, we're pursuing the idea of love, love being central, but we do it with this all humility, not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less, with gentleness, a a tenderness, power under control, with patience, meaning I'm willing to bear with others. I'm willing to put up with their idiosyncrasies, even their sin. And by put up with here, I mean not take revenge because I'm eager, I'm passionate about, I'm pursuing with all my might, the unity in the bride of Christ, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now we said in these, we want to apply them. So how do we apply this? The application for this, and just two simple ones, the therefore is where I want to start. Therefore, let's be a people who love the doctrine of the Bible, who love the greatness of salvation, the greatness of our call, and let's see ourselves as a prisoner of the Lord, whether that's figurative or literal. We trust him and he is sovereign over all circumstances and he's the Lord of our lives. We'll do whatever he calls Let's live in a manner worthy of the calling we've received. And that means, as you can see by this very marked up verse, eagerly pursuing unity, eagerly in the bride of Christ, taking ownership of this personally and living lives that show the love of God shining through us to others on display because God has changed us and in that change has called us to love with humility and gentleness and patience and to pursue this unity that he has created in us and through us and for us because we are found in Christ. It's so good to be examining the scriptures with you, Cloverdale Baptist Church.